Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth. We're talking Star Wars Rogue One. We're talking Fast 8 trailers. We're talking more drama behind Deadpool 2. Packed day today. Also here, host of Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. Clearly going to the Star Wars premiere has gone to my head. No, it hasn't. <laughs> I'm worthless. <laughs> also here, Mark Ellis. I'm not worthless because I went to the Rogue One premiere and man, it felt good. What a night. What a night. Also here, Jeremy Johns. <laughs> is it as cool as staying home and doing nothing, Mark? <laughs> I is love it? staying home and doing nothing. You know I'm a big fan of that. This was better. The Force Awakens is available on Blu-ray. <laughs> I watched it. I watched, I, did. Watched I, did. I actually did that. Well, while these guys are all at their Rogue One premiere, I was like, I'm going to watch Force Awakens. Whatever. Who's having fun? I'm having fun. But you do get to go. You're going to go see Rogue One. Or, yeah, you're going to see Rogue One immediately after this show today. At least we get to talk about Rogue One before I do. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you something, though? I think we're all jealous of you because you get to see it, see it for, the for the first, first time. time. Yeah. We, yeah, you know what? Yeah. I do have that those moments. Like, people are like, oh, I'm going to see Breaking Bad for the first time. I was like, I envy that yeah. experience. So, like, yeah, The Wire. Yeah. Like, like, when I was yeah. watching The Wire, Harloff was like, I'm glad you get to experience that for yeah, the first time. Yeah, and Breaking time. Bad was yeah. the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, let's get started. Rogue One, a Star Wars story, was finally unveiled this past weekend at its worldwide premiere event at the Pantages Theater in Hollywood. Soon after, the first reactions to the film hit online, and the response is overwhelmingly positive. Praises being heaped on the film in pretty much every department, the action, the story, the characters, with some people even going so far as to say it'll crack their personal top 10 list of the year. John, you were also at the premiere event. What are some of the more positive reactions out there about Rogue One, a Star Wars story? Well, yeah, we uh, all of us here at the table, right, Jeremy? All of us here at the table, yep. except Jeremy, went yep. to the premiere of uh, of Rogue One th this past weekend, and, and what an experience! And let's get to the social media stuff here in just a second. We thought we'd just share a couple quick uh, pictures with you of of us at the evening. So let's bring up the the first one there. This is uh, there's Tiff and Dennis and Perry and Wendy and Mark huh. and myself, uh, Christian and his beautiful wife. We were all. We, we got uh -huh. dolled up. We took the limo to go down. We had an extra seat for Jeremy. We uh -huh. forgot why he wasn't yeah. there. It was a yeah. big limo. Sure. It was yeah. a big, big There was limo. plenty of space. Mm -hmm. could have fit. Yeah, yeah it probably could have fit. It looks good. It looks fun. <laughs> so that's all us getting ready to go. Let's bring up the next one. And oh. there's Dennis and Perry and Wendy there in front of the same place where you just saw the cast. This was down at, at the red carpet. Let's bring up the next one there. Uh, Dennis <laughs> got to pose with the man. Dennis got to pose with the oh, man. God. I'll be honest with you. I don't know who looks more intimidating. I know. It's true. <laughs> yeah, Dennis looking badass. I took Dennis a picture. looks pretty badass. Ran into Kevin Feige down there. It's great wow. cosplay, um, Feige there. Yeah. If you can't notice, that's a baby Groot hat that Kevin is oh, wearing. That's cool. uh, Kevin, of course, is the president of Marvel Studios. We got to hang out for a little bit. Let's bring up the next one there. They had a life-size, two-scale X-Wing fighter on Hollywood Boulevard. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of us taking our pictures there. Christian had rushed off ahead of us, so. My wife was cold. Yeah, yeah, and it was cold. It was a chilly evening. And are there more? That's oh, I awesome. forgot. Yeah, me and, that, and Mark. And, and that's when I was saying, why couldn't you wear an extra sweater? <laughs> <laughs> we ran into Dave Filoni, exec producer, uh, creative head of uh, Clone Wars, Rebels, stuff like that, in his Hallmark hat. I thanked and him for wearing the hat because it makes him so easy to spot. Yeah. I know. He's di he would yeah. completely disappear yeah. in, into the ether. And right after that, he took it off. <laughs> he took it off. <laughs> and I think it's safe to say, the, first of all, we won't go into our reactions to the movie, but showing up there was kind of surreal. Um, it was great. It was one of those. We don't get these. Look, we're YouTube nobodies, okay? So when we get to have these weird little experiences, it's fun. Like we pull up in the limousine and we had one of those Hollywood moments where we open the door, we get out, and then across the street in Hollywood bunch Boulevard is all the fans. fans yeah. And a bunch of the fans start, they all recognize us and they start yelling out to us, asking us to come over for pictures. It was a surreal Hollywood moment, I think, for, the last, for a lot of us. The party was a lot of fun. The, the party was great. Well, as a fellow YouTube nobody, it sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say. We all had a good, what was, what was your most memorable thing of the night? 
Yeah, uh, Harloff, tell us. I mean, I, look, it, it, even though we, we were able to go last year and that, that experience of getting out and being there, you're like, oh, yeah, we've done this before. I think you could go 100 times and you still feel like, wow. This, it, it's because it's the energy in the, it, at the place. It's, it's, you feel, it's, it's, so, it's just so different from everyone who's there. It's, just, it's an event. It, I'm, I love that Disney has been doing this in general because not only for people that were there, if you were streaming it, you could see the excitement and, and the who's who in the, in the Star Wars universe. I mean, for me, what I thought was really cool – I walk down, I see Lawrence Kasdan, John Knoll. I mean, all these people that were there, the part of the Star Wars universe, Kathleen Kennedy is there. I saw Bob Iger is like one of my uh, idols, and I get everything, you see him and all of him. So just seeing these <laughs> Look particular Jeremy's people. Jeremy's face is priceless. <laughs> <laughs> but you just, to see these particular people and know that th- this is happening, like, because I, I went back and I watched a video that Mark and I did when we found out the news. That, that Disney bought Lucasfilm. And this pure excitement of, what are we going to get? What's going to happen? What other movies besides the soccer films are going to happen? And we were there to experience it. This is, this is the, it was an experiment that Bob Iger said. It was an experiment. And to see everyone showing up for that experiment and the excitement in the air before and afterwards was everything that I really enjoyed about it. So th- that's what I took home from it. There, there, you know, I think there's an unwritten rule amongst a lot of married couples where each married couple is they have their exception list. Like, yeah, you can leave me for this person. I'm pretty sure Wendy Lee's person is Nathan Fillion. Yeah. So <laughs> we we're in we walk into the theater and we're standing in the foyer and Wendy's about to just go walking off to the bathroom and I grab her and I'm like, Wendy, do you know who this is right in front of you? And his back was to us. She goes, I don't know, Christian Bale, because we had literally just bumped into Christian Bale on the carpet. I said, no, it's not Christian Bale. She goes, I don't know who. I said, that's Nathan Fillion, one feet, one foot in front of you. And her face, your face when I said that. Was <laughs> <laughs> so she runs around him to get to make sure it was actually him. And then, But at, unfortunately, at that point, we didn't have our cell phones on us, so she couldn't get a picture with him. But that was, I'm sure that would, that had to be your highlight of the night, right? That, I Nathan? think I was just over, sensory overload. I mean, I got to go to the premiere. I got to see the movie and I meet my favorite actor of all time. I got to shake his hand. He has the softest hand in the world. <laughs> Good Canadian boy, by the way. What some one of your favorite moments? Of the uh, night? Just the fans. I mean, as soon as we got out of the limo, it was great to have that buzz in the air. It's like they needed like security to take us over to the barricade where all the Which fans was were. Odd. You feel so important because you got these like three <laughs> huge dudes walking over there with you, just helping, making sure. My mom wouldn't know I was dead for a week, and these guys like <laughs> actually care about our safety and well-being, which we didn't need because the fans are always awesome. So that was the big highlight to me. The, the, the post party was so much fun just interacting, rubbing shoulders with all these people. One of my favorite parts of the night was when we were, uh, I, I grabbed two buckets of corn and uh, John is walking over to get corn. He turns around with his bucket and he walks by and I was like, dude, did you see you just walk by? And you're like, no. And I was like, Michael, Michael Douglas. Douglas. That was just- Michael. He just walked right by Michael Douglas. You looked at him and you're like, eh. <laughs> and he didn't notice it was Michael Douglas, and his face went white. He was like, oh, my God, that was Michael Douglas. We should go tell him happy birthday to your dad who turned 100. That's what we did. Yeah. You know, by the way, just because he is, uh, you know, from the southern regions of the states, when he says a bucket of corn, he is referring <laughs> to popcorn. Corn. I know, I know. <laughs> he is actually no, they're actually full, full, full corn. cobs of corn He's here. He's yeah. referring <laughs> shaped as Tie Fighters. <laughs> All right, but let's talk about now the movie itself. Now, just to give you some context for how we're going to talk about this. The movie is under review embargo until tomorrow morning. However, Disney and Lucasfilm did allow everybody to tweet out their social media reactions to the film. So we cannot ref- we can't give any kind of review for the movie, but we can read some tweets that went out from a bunch of the people who were there with us at the theater. So Adam, let's bring the first one. The first one from Rain Wilson, wow. Dwight from the office. He was there. Him, He's actually sitting like three rows oh, in front of us. Huh. He says, uh, first Rogue One review, it was actually amazing, super fun and exciting. Ties in with episode four perfectly. Let's go to the next one here. This next one comes from our buddy Peter Serretta over at Slash Film. Star Wars fans will be very happy with Rogue One. It's fun, action-packed, doesn't feel neutered by reshoots. Donnie Yen and K2SO are standouts. Let's go with the next one here. Uh, me, just because this question came up a lot. Everybody was asking us, is it as good as The Force Awakens? Is it better than The Force Awakens? So I tweeted this. As much as I like The Force Awakens, yes, I like Rogue One even more. Thursday can't get here fast enough to see it again. Let's move on to the next one. We got Kevin Smith, who said, <laughs> Holy Sith, Rogue One movie is unbelievably wonderful. No lie, it is The Empire Strikes Back. Great, an excellent chapter in the Star Wars universe. Let's go on to the next one here. Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton. Got on there. Wheaton said, the last time I loved a Star Wars movie uh, this much, 
as much as I love Rogue One, it was 1977. And I think we got one more here. Uh, Jermaine Lucier, who's, of course, our buddy. He's over at io9. He wrote, holy crap, did I love Rogue One. It's going to take days to wipe the smile off my face. So many surprises. So much fun. Get excited. These are the types of reactions. And, and I'm telling you, it's not like we just handpicked a couple of positive ones. This was the reaction across the board from everybody who was there. I can't remember. The, I'm sure I have. I just can't remember the last time I heard an audience applaud that much at the end uh, of a film that I've been at for a premiere. It was The reaction was overwhelming. But Jeremy, as the one guy who wasn't there, you're reading now. <laughs> you're hearing all the social media reaction. You're seeing everybody's stuff. Where's your expectation level right now for Rogue One? And how do, do these reactions from the premiere affect it? Well, I'm glad you asked me, John. As the foremost authority on Rogue One, <laughs> uh, I, I think I, I'm, I'm trying to keep my expectations low, but I do want to tell everybody getting their picture taken with Darth Vader, that's not the real Darth Vader. That's just one of his helpers, okay? <laughs> it's one of his helpers, but he'll give Santa the real list. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, I'm trying to keep my expectations... Like uh, when... Um, Kevin Smith says Empire Strikes Back quality. I want to be like, I'm a, I want to pull back and go, okay, I, I want to manage the expectations to be somewhere along the lines of the original Star Wars, uh, Force Awakens, uh, the, you know, like I, Empire Strikes Back is literally saying it's going to be one of my favorite movies of all time. So I, 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 I'm trying to see it as a great chapter in Star Wars and leave it at that. I don't like going in there like, yeah, it's going to be the best movie ever. I mean, I'm going to hurrah, hurrah, hurrah myself when I'm in line. You, you can't help it. And just to make you jealous, I get to see it today. And you so, do. So you there. Do. So you're like, I don't have to wait till Thursday, John, for you to <laughs> fulfill your John. So there. But uh, that's where I'm trying to see it, is, uh, is somewhere in the, in the lines of a great Star Wars movie that I'm trying not to see it as Empire Strikes Back. It's fine. I, I will say this. I bumped into one of the executives of Lucasfilm at the after party, talked to them about it, and I said, you know, this has got to be particularly satisfying, uh, seeing the reaction from all, all these people. And the executive said to me, he goes, you know what? I, I've seen the film already, obviously, before tonight. I can't believe how much I love this film. Nice. And, and, and that's, that's, that's coming from the people who had to sit through it and watch the edits and, right. and kind of be sick of it by now. Yeah. But then sitting down with that audience and watching with that audience, even they were completely thrilled. That's a great, that's a great thing. Because like beta testing something is grinding. You know, by the, by the time the end product comes out, you're like, I'm done. I've seen it all a hundred times. And so for them to still love the movie, that's actually and a even as people good. who are like, because everybody's very excited. It feels like Christmas morning for Ebenezer Scrooge before the movie because everybody's so excited excited to go see it the fact that everybody was buzzing about the night afterwards at the post party that means it's something special to me so actually let's go over to you ashley like you were not there at the premiere with us you haven't no. had a chance to see the, you haven't had a chance to see the movie yet <laughs> Yay, Mova. but you're seeing all of this are you able to like keep your expectations in check because look it was the premiere so obviously everybody's energy levels a little bit higher maybe they're <laughs> reacting a little more pro more positively so yeah. are you able to keep your expectations in check or do does hearing all this on social media increase your expectations? Well, I'm seeing it today, just like Jeremy. So I'm excited. <laughs> nice. And if you guys who are like the bi biggest um, critics on earth that I know of, at least, uh, especially in the Star Wars universe, and if you guys are liking it, then of course I'm going to like it too. So I'm excited. Yeah, so I mean, hold tight. Now, just to let you know, a lot of people have been asking us online, when can you review the film? The review embargo lifts tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We do have a non-spoiler review that we have already shot that will go up online tomorrow, but also make sure you check back in on Movie Talk tomorrow as well because we're going to talk a lot of Rogue One now that the muzzle comes off and we can actually talk about it a little bit more. So both of those are coming tomorrow. Keep your eyes open. All right, what's next? Okay. Ever since Tim Miller exited the production of Deadpool 2 over creative differences, many reports have hit online stating that Miller and star slash producer Ryan Reynolds disagreed about the scope of the sequel and the casting of the character of Cable. During an interview on CG Garage, Miller finally spoke about why he left the project, also clearing up that he was never going to cast Kyle Chandler as Cable. Speaking about it all, Miller said, I didn't want to make some stylized movie that was three times the budget. If you read the internet, who cares really? But for those of you who do, I wanted to make the same kind of movie that we made before because I think that's the right movie to make for the character. So don't believe what you read on the internet. Jeremy, what do you think about Tim Miller's comments? Um, I actually, 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I I like the fact that this is a there's a there are two sides to every story kind of scenario, you know. And if his motivation for it is like I just kind of wanted to keep it in the pockets, what we saw with Deadpool, I really do believe it's a case of if you limit somebody, it's like George Lucas in the '70s, you know, where it's like he had the studio going against him, and that kept his budget small and it kept him creative. I feel like that could be the thing that drove Deadpool to be a great movie. And if you wanted to keep it there, I think that's great. Um, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I have no reason to be like, ah, it's full of garbage. No, that's not how it went down. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I like his motivation behind it, and I like his perspective behind it, and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt for sure. Christian, it's really interesting to me because what he's, everything that he's saying didn't happen is, is the reports apparently why he left in general. So right. if, the, if these aren't the case, well, what the hell was the case? Right. Because Kyle Chandler apparently wasn't going to be um, Cable. They were going to keep it on the same tone, all these different things. And the fact that he's really catering towards the, like he says in the interview, the a geek audience, I think that it could be a little cleanup for him also because Ryan Reynolds is a huge star. So when we hear Ryan Reynolds says something, it's going to get a little bit more, it's going to carry a little more weight than when Tim Miller says it, or at least it's going to get more exposure exposure when Ryan Reynolds says it so he's getting his voice out there to say no no that's no, not the case don't believe everything you said here's the reason here's the things that I want to talk about I applaud him for it honestly I mean because this is something that he should do he should make his case he did a really great job with Deadpool mm -hmm. and his career shouldn't be hurt by the fact that he is not going to be part of part two he's going to be doing more things I think we're going to get great things from him and all eyes will be on his next project though yeah for sure after this one it's like oh it was you a one trick pony just because he had Ryan Reynolds and Deadpool but we'll see so I, I actually applaud the comments because I think it was good for him to get his voice out there I'm I'm a little torn about whether I like the fact that he's made these comments or not because I feel like the story was done I felt like the story was done. No one was talking. About it. No one ble like the story was out there that he wanted a bigger film, right? But nobody, if if that had been the case, nobody was blaming him for that. That's that's understandable. Um, Ryan Reynolds came out recently, says nobody on this planet worked harder on Deadpool than Tim Miller. You know, and Fox clearly had no problem with Tim Miller because Tim Miller's next film is a Fox film that they just hired him on mm -hmm. to do. Obviously, everybody was happy, and I kind of felt like after like a couple of weeks, the story had finally died. So him making these comments now, I don't have a problem with it. I don't because, if, look, if he wants to get his side of it out, I get that. But I felt like, on, on the other hand, I feel like nobody was mad at him and the story had finally died. Maybe it would have been wiser just to leave it alone because now that he's made these comments and he had every right to make the comments, especially if that's the truth, he had every right to make the comments. I got a feel. I got a feeling now. This story is now no longer done. <laughs> now people are going to keep talking about this story. At some point, I think Ryan Reynolds will probably now make some kind of comment on top of that. And whereas the story was dead and gone, and nobody was talking about it anymore, and everybody had moved on, now it's not. And I just wonder if he should have sat back and thought, would it be better for me to get out to the public the fact that now I didn't want a bigger movie. Or it would be more worth it to me to just let the story go because everybody's happy and everybody's moved on. I don't know. It's a tough part. I don't know what I would have done if I was in this situation. It's, it's a tough call. What would you have done? Well, that's the contingency is that I would have done just what Tim Miller did if I felt like my side of the story was not getting out accurately. Even if you risk stirring up a hornet's nest again, what I hope these comments do is now put the issue to bed. Because at this point, it almost feels like these two guys are running for office. And, and we're about to get into political smear campaign territory, which I don't want to see. But Christian's right. Ryan Reynolds, he won Entertainer of the Year last night. He's a huge megastar. So for him to say something, people are going to pick up on it more than what Tim Miller says. So if Ryan Reynolds has his take, I think it's fair for Tim Miller to be able to get his take out, especially when you have something like a lot of people are saying, why did he want Kyle Chandler's cable? Well, if he didn't want that, he should be able to say that. But I hope that this now goes away because each person has had their side get out in the media and now we can all move on happily. All right, let's move on. What's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by AMC Theaters. Disney's Moana snagged the number one spot for a third weekend in a row, taking in $18.8 million. Office Christmas Party opened the number two spot on its first weekend of release, taking in $17.5 million. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them made $10.78 million for the number three spot at the box office, with Paramount's arrival taking the number four spot with $5.6 million. Rounding out the top five was Doctor Strange. The Marvel release 
took the number five spot with 4.6 million, bringing its domestic total to 222.3 million. Mark, were you surprised Moana took the number one spot for a third weekend in a row? I was not surprised Moana took the number one spot because it was really only going up against Office Christmas Party was the biggest release that came out, which did well. It's a very different audience, and Moana has all that Disney family momentum going for it. So it's nice to see it only drop, I think, 30 or 35 percent, something like that. What impressed me most about this weekend at the box office is that it showed us that Oscar season is now in full swing because mm. you had films like Nocturnal Animals and Manchester by the Sea expand to more markets. Their percentage went up huge numbers, and they're starting to rake in some cash because people are talking about them because it's award season and they want to see them. It seems like the response has been pretty positive. Jeremy. Yeah, it's really funny. It's like, all right, they're expanding. They're getting more markets. They're raking in more money. Still not on the top five, but, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're getting bigger. I think the real star of this weekend were all the trailers that dropped online. Holy smokes. I feel like more people watch those than watch the movies this weekend. <laughs> However, Moana being number one, does it shock me? Absolutely not. This is the power of the kids' film. It's the power of a good kids' film. And it's also the power of the empire known as Disney, which is going to become self-aware and become Skynet one day. <laughs> we're just waiting for it to happen. But, uh... I, it, it's kind of funny that Doctor Strange is holding on. I love seeing Arrival hold on. This is holding on to this number four mm -hmm. now. Uh, a little shocked that Fantastic Beast is still in there, but given the competition, I shouldn't be. So, uh, I mean, it's a it's a top five that if I had to list the top five this weekend, it would probably look something like that. But I'm telling you, man, I did like five videos this weekend, all of them trailers. I look at it like that's the about. summer of 2016 apologizing to us for all the movies it right, made. Right, so right, it's right. like, yeah, you know yeah. what? Here's some trailers for stuff we think you're going to love. All this Christmas party is interesting, too, because it made $17 million, right? Which is not a huge number. The, th that movie made its money the same way that Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates made its money opening week. Weekend because the title sounds funny, yes. so people are gonna want to go see a raunchy comedy like that. Right, and there's not a lot of competition for it. Not right. until uh, not until Why Him comes out will there be actual competition for Office Christmas Party. So it has nothing but free range. It's like mm -hmm. all right, fish in a barrel style for the audience. Christian, um, I, the one, two, three, and five spot are all mo movies that I thought we're gonna place where they did. Arrival to me is the biggest standout. Arrival to me for the for the lack of marketing budget, for the fact that it didn't really cost much to make. That's a pretty big hit. I mean, yep. that's a hit for them for what they're going to do with 78 or 80 million, whatever it's made so far in a movie that probably, I think it costs like between 40 and 50. And the, the buzz. 85. It, it cost 85? Yeah. Production budget was 85 million. Eight, or that's probably including. The marketing was. Not including marketing. Well, the marketing was low. Marketing was low overall too. Right, so everything right. that it's done overall, I think that that particular movie is is a standout for what. And you're going to see even a bigger bump once it, there's going to be some Oscar nods for that movie also. And I think that it's a movie that deserves the praise. It's definitely going to be in my top three of the year. And so I'm really excited to see that it's done kind of the business that it's done. Um, but yeah, Moana's no surprise. Moana was was one that, like I, you hit the nail on the head as to, as to where it's the only kid movie out right now, like the, the one that you can see. And I think another one that's gonna give it's probably start knocking that back is when Sing comes out. Sing will knock mm -hmm. that back. But Office Christmas Party and all everyone else, this the number is gonna be significantly lower come Friday. You know, <laughs> yeah. Even its counter programming, it's still gonna get blown away by the tidal wave that is Rogue One. It's a great question: is what is the one that's gonna stand up to the title Rogue One the best? It might be Office Christmas Party because it's such a different kind of movie it's uh, got christmas it's got raunchy humor very very different than what still, you see in rogue but one this this, Ro this star wars is geared though it's, it's the first star wars movie really geared towards adults and i think that the office christmas party office is gonna uh, office is gonna go see that movie i think moana is gonna be the one that can can stand strong mm -hmm. next to it the funny thing about arrival is it's i it, i think financially it's still not it still hasn't made a profit it's, overseas even over, i think it's it's worldwide total is about 125 million right now uh, which at a budget of 85 million, you're probably looking for it to make another five or 10 or 15 million dollars for it to crack the break even point um, on that. But it, it will get there. And I agree with you, especially once some Oscar nods get out and it's going to enjoy a little bit of a resurgence. Yeah. The thing that really stands out to me a lot is La La Land, which opened at number 15 on five screens. Wow. Here's an interesting number. One of the statistics that comes out. Uh, every week at the box office is what was its per screen average? How much money did this movie make per screen that it was on? The big winner this week uh, was Office Christmas Party, which made five thousand four hundred dollars per screen. It was on Moana made three thousand eight hundred, sorry, four thousand eight hundred per screen. Then you get down to Arrival made one thousand seven hundred dollars per screen. La La Land. Anybody want to take a guess? 
How well, much it made per screen? F- number fifteen. Remember on number five two. Screens. Yeah, number two. Seven thousand made yeah. five thousand four hundred per screen. You're saying seven thousand? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I I saw that. Oh, you looked it up. What's uh, your guess? Eight. <laughs> One hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars per screen. Yeah, was it crazy. at the Staples Center? <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, remember uh-huh. that's not per showing. That's per screen. So if it had like five, t- yeah. seven showings that day, it counts right. all of that. Once it go line. wide, it goes wide that's soon. Nice. And in a week or two. Yeah. So La La Land, La Land is getting a ton of awards buzz. It just won a couple of awards at the Broadcast Film Critics Society last night. It's going to win more awards going forward. Watch out! Look, La La Land's not going to make a hundred million dollars in its opening weekend, but for a artistic. Oscar bait kind of film, it's going to do bonkers business for that sort of a thing. So that's the thing that on the uh, on the list that stands out to me the most is that per screen average is yeah, just absolutely nuts. All right, guys, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley Mova has a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? The first trailer for the eighth movie in the Fast and Furious franchise, The Fate of the Furious, has arrived online from Universal Pictures. The movie finds Vin Diesel's Dom and his crew facing off against Jason Statham's returning villain, along, along with Charlize Theron as a brand new adversary. Straight out of Compton, director F. Gary Gray is helming the film that also stars Dwayne Johnson, Michelle Rodriguez, Tyrese Gibson, and Chris Ludacris Bridges. The Fate of the Furious opens in theaters on April 14th 2017. Christian, buy us all the first trailer for The Fate of the Furious. Now, I really like, I love five, really like six, and thought seven was, was pretty good, and, and they ended it well, and I'm excited to see this one. I'm selling the trailer because I didn't know what the story was about, and it's like, I felt like an, like, it's like when they don't know what to do anymore, like, and then what if, what if Dom gets amnesia? It's like, it, that's not what the, the <laughs> particular story is, but you know, she's doing something with him, like she's got something over him, so now he's got to turn on his, I don't want to see Dom, or uh, Dom Herrera, I was going to say, I don't want to see Dom <laughs> as a, I don't want to see him as a, uh, you know, a bad guy or a potential bad guy, or they're going after him, and, and then Statham, who was like the, was like the ultimate bad guy now they're teaming up with him i'm sure he'll turn to the end i don't know it just i know that these movies are silly i love how silly they are it's it's one of the things i really enjoy the title is awful by the way but i still want to see the movie i'm still excited about the movie the trailer just did nothing and it was even more over the top than i think the the other ones were i don't know it just i was excited to watch the trailer and then i left going "Eh." i buy this trailer big look i I abs- I've said this before. I absolutely hated the first three Fast and the Furious movies. I thought they were all atrocious. The first one's just a shot by shot remake of Point Break. I-, I just thought it was terrible. And then four happened. And I'm like, that was that actually wasn't bad. And then The Rock got involved. Then we had five and six and seven. The Fast and the Furious franchise has embraced the notion of dumb fun films. They've embraced it. That's not just what they- they've embraced it and they actually go after it. We all thought, maybe they'll ne- next, where do they go next? They go to space. Nope, now they're going to fight submarines. And then when that submarine came up out of the ice, I'm like, this is so ridiculous, I'm loving Where's it. Where's Batman and the shark repellent? I know, exactly. <laughs> and if it was done in a Fast and the Furious movie, I would buy it because that's totally what they go for and embrace. The, here's the one problem I have. In the original Fast and Furious movies, like, Dom is, he's just a street tough, smart wise, a street wise guy who races cars. But now he's like the most elite of international assassins who can take on anybody. <laughs> He'll take on The Rock, BS. He'll take on The Rock and Jason Statham together. I don't know. But it is kind of an interesting term because we, on this face, we are at the point of what the hell do you do with this franchise now? Dom turns on them. Okay, great. Do it. Whatever. <coughs> I, look, the trailer was fun to me, so I'm going to give it a bye. Okay, anyone who thinks this is too ridiculous is not embracing the triple X Fast and Furious crossover that they're actually going for. <laughs> Mark my words on that. Um, I buy the trailer too. The title, I agree. It's it's, it's awful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's awful. one of those like the, like what were they gonna call it though? The Fast er er and the Furious er er er. Like I mean, you know. So I, I get why they felt like they needed to make Just a turn. But the, yeah, right. But, but the yeah. fate of the Furious is a little dorky. Um, but. At a point when they said Charlize Theron's, what, what is she, some technological genius or something like that? I'm like, oh, it's nanotech in his brain that's mind controlling him. It's going to be that. I promise you he's going to have a chip in his head, and that's how she's controlling him. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a leverage thing, unless he somehow is like, I had this plan from the beginning. I am Groot. And then, like, <laughs> right. you know, they're all going to be like, oh, it was like a plan from the beginning. I, I don't want an ending like that. But I agree with you, John. 
it's dumb fun in the sense that's not Michael Bay dumb fun because it's actually fun. Like it's not garbage. It's not just loud garbage. I uh, I didn't. I saw the first Fast and Furious. Did not see the second one. Did not see the third one. Did not see the fourth one. But heard they made it better. So I saw the fifth one and I liked it. And I saw the sixth one. I liked it. So I, I it's a franchise that found its stride around the fifth movie, which usually would kill a franchise by that point. But not this one. So I. But given the past three, I'm buying it. So, man, this, this thing made the Triple X trailer look like a rival. Like, it's just so stupid. It's just so dumb. I like the action. I like the action. The submarine coming up at the end, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm on board with that. But when you try to cram this ridiculous story into a dumb, fun action movie, it makes no sense. Nobody loves dumb action more than this guy right here. This face is a face that enjoys stupid, ridiculous adventure nonsense. And this trailer was too over the top for me. And it's the Dom storyline. It's, it's the awful. I don't care if it's nanotechnology. I don't care what it is because there, that's the only way that it that it could happen. He's not going right. back on family. He's Badly. like he's not just trying to like pull a ruse on him to like come back the other way. He tried to kill his family, and that just that just takes away the spirit of the movie for me because now we know we're gonna have to work this entire film to get our Dom back. And that's such laborious work for me that I don't want to do it. It's I want to see them all, work. I want to see them all be a team. Like, why can't we just have silly, ridiculous A-team style adventures with this crew without resorting to some dumb gimmick like mind control? It's just, I'm worried the fact that like, the whole thing, it's, and it just goes, there's been rumors that you're gonna spin off and get The Rock's character in his yeah. own movie here. This is what they're setting up. It is a setup movie the same way that they're doing it that they did for like the event. Ooh, Hobbs and Jason Statham will but have that, buddy cop but movies that's kind later of, on. No, but that's kind I of, would watch that. That's <laughs> kind of what they're setting up because if you think about it, for the majority of this movie, as it looks in the trailer, Vin Diesel, who's been the star of all these movies, is going to be on some side adventure with Charlize Theron. You know, so it's like that's that's really what we're gonna see for the majority of the movie. It's gonna be Statham and The Rock leading the team now. But come on, we know it's it's not which nanotech. Is not, which is it's not nanotechnology. It's not mind control. It's I thought the trailer laid out pretty safe. They have Paul Walker. They have they have the Paul Walker character and his family. I, I, I'm I'm almost convinced that is what they have over that's Dom. Probably they have his sister call. and his niece. That's a good call. Yeah, and I think that's probably I don't, what it is. I, it, I'm not by, look dumb fun you know is why? an art form because you don't know family. Yeah, that's why. Right. I do know family. That's why I'm not buying it. You know, as uh, as someone who has not seen Rogue One, you didn't, and uh, <laughs> and, and someone who. Really loves the Lacutus of Borg storyline <laughs> in Star Trek: The Next Generation. I see the potential in the mind control and everything that he's going to remember. Mind control chips, folks, always a good gimmick. All right, so look, we're divided here on the table about whether or not this is a trailer worth watching or not. You guys have seen it. We want to know what you think, and that is the topic of our Twitter question of the day. It's simple: buy or sell. The fate of the... Oh, I can't even say it. Yeah, Fast and Furious 8. The Fast 8, eight. Yeah. Fast eight trailer. Buy or sell. That is up on our Twitter fate, fate, fate. right That's now. That's what it is. That's fate. why it's Fate of the Furious. It's, it's F8 of the Furious. Uh, ooh, ooh, how about this? The family of the Furious. But F8 means fate, fate. of the... Fate. That's what it. Fate that's the, why it's fate. called fate of the... We made it make sense. We're going down a rabbit trail here. So, <laughs> simply make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Go there right now. We have the poll up. We will check in with you guys a little bit later at the end of the show. Buy or sell this Fast 8 trailer. All right, fate. with that out of the way, what's next? According to a report from Deadline, Sony has set the sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming to debut in theaters on July 5th, 2019, while also setting Bad Boys 4, the sequel to the recently titled Bad Boys for Life, to Memorial Day weekend, where it is now set to hit theaters on May 24th, 2019. Bad Boys 4 will now be going up against Warner Brothers' Minecraft, while the Spider-Man sequel is largely in the clear over that Independence Day weekend. Bad Boys for Life, the third movie in the franchise, will be directed by Joe Carnegie hand and will debut in theaters on January 28, 2018. John Byers sell the new release dates for the Spider-Man Homecoming sequel and Bad Boys 4. Not only are they showing confidence in the film by announcing a sequel already well before the first one comes out, I think they're showing an awful lot of confidence by dropping it in a July date. I think that's talking a... about Spider-Man? Yeah, talking yeah. about Spider-Man, sorry. Th that is just, to me, is just a great vote of confidence for that. I think it's terrific. Now, I had a little chat with somebody involved in the new Spider-Man film. Ooh. Um, oh. And what I'll say is this, is that there was some behind-the-scenes drama between... We knew there was, there was going to be, between Sony and Marvel over the direction of this film. Sony very much wanted one way, 
Marvel wanted very much another. What this person told me was that they were really impressed with how well they compromised with each other, and both sides are thrilled with the movie they came up with. So apparently, Marvel wanted this kind of a flavor of film, Sony wanted the other, they decided to meld them together and they came up with something, and they're all saying that they're all really, really happy with it, which just kind of goes towards the point of that they're announcing a sequel already. They're announcing a prime date sequel. For me, this is a big buy. Mark, what about uh, you? It's a huge buy. For me, Independence Day weekend for Spider-Man, for the next Spider-Man movie, you're right. It shows a lot of confidence. People universally like the trailer if they didn't love it. Um, the, the thing that's curious to me is I don't know what is going to make Josh McCuga happier. The fact that he got engaged <laughs> over the weekend or the fact that Bad Boys 4 has been announced. Which, by the way, congratulations to Josh yeah. McCuga. Yeah. Um, whether it's nanotechnology mind right. control, well, he's got it. something over that's her it. parents, I don't know. Somehow Josh McCuga talked a girl far out of his league to, into marrying him. So congrats to you, to Amanda. Blink twice if you need help. You know what? He did run me off the road last night, yeah. and now it all makes sense. I'm going to have to team up with Jason Statham. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like all these release dates. The Bad Boys 4 versus Minecraft is going to be a really interesting right. marketing fight because Minecraft has an uphill battle to climb to convince us why we need a Minecraft movie. If it pulls that off, then Bad Boys might be getting a little nervous. I happen to think Bad Boys for Life is going to be fantastic cinema, dumb fun, done right, and so I'm very excited about these release Christian. dates. Um, okay, so for Spider-Man, yeah, it makes all the sense in the world. This, this is a movie you look, you just trace it back to the impact that he had during Civil War. He was the, the big standout. Then you see this trailer. Everyone's raving about the trailer. Um, I, I totally buy what John was talking about with that report he had probably from Kevin Feige himself at this point. Uh, after we see those pictures from, nice pick. from Rogue One. But, uh, what, no, I think that what... Uh, this is a movie, it is a perfect blend from what I saw. It is that John Hughes feel plus kind of the old school Spider-Man movies that we've seen over the last couple of years. It, was, it looked like that kind of mix. So I buy that. I think it makes sense. And I think that you should announce a Spider-Man sequel because he's going to be such a big part of the MCU. I, I think they're shooting too quick with, with Bad Boys. I mean, they're going, we're talking about another. They've already announced the Bad Boys 4. That's what, that's what the story yeah. is. Why? I mean, like. Because it's going to be great. Bad <laughs> <laughs> let's let's wait. Let's see. Like it, I think like a movie like Dumb and Dumber, three or whatever two, and then you have uh, Zoolander. Granted, they're comedies and not action, but these are movies. It's been a long time since the last Bad, last Bad Boys, and then they're just gonna say the third one's definitely gonna hit. We're going for two more. Just wait. Just I'm not telling you don't plan it out, but wait to release. Wait to release it because if this movie doesn't hit the way that they want it to, Bad Boys, then then they've they've done all this. It's like what they did with Fantastic Four, right? Which is a little different, honestly, because I could see that more so getting the announcement. But the movie was a pile of garbage, and then they canceled it like we knew that they would. I don't think that Bad Boys, because if this movie doesn't have the opening that they have, I don't think Bad Boys 4 is going to uh, is gonna happen. But Spider-Man, regardless, is going to happen. See, I think it's almost a no-brainer that Bad Boys for Life is going to have a huge opening. It's not going to be Beauty and the Beast numbers. But, but if because, it's not good, though. But, but you look at the Fast 5 and Fast 6 kind of movies, as long as they get that dumb, fun tone, which Bad Boys 1 and 2 did nail. Triple X tried, and Jack Reacher Tri 2 tried it. Didn't it? I, I, think, I just think this team up, I think, <clears throat> I think this is a pretty sure bet. Okay, well, uh, now that you're finished your comments, I, I'm looking back. I'm looking at the box office things. I just want to bring this up right now. Arrival and Allied are two titles that were right beside each other, and they look an awful lot alike. I said that the budget for Arrival, I'm looking at the IMDb page right now, for Arrival was $85 million. That was actually Allied. That was $85 million. Arrival is $47 That's what million. I thought so it was wasn't right. You were right. I just, I just wanted to throw it out there. You were right. Okay, what's next? Too late, John. The comment section has already done its part. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, everyone, I hope you fast forwarded here before you commented. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just timestamp it. All right, so I'm a little. You guys need to clear this up. So, Bad Boys for Life is Bad Boys 4, not 3? No, Bad Boys for Life is Bad Boys 3. three. But they three. And then, and then but a Bad Boys 4. four. Yeah. All right, well, first be of all, the fate of the Bad, bad Boys. Bad Boys 5 Life. <laughs> yeah, Bad, bad Boys 5. Five right, so if, if we're <laughs> griping about the Fate of the Furious uh, title being lame, Bad Boys for Life is a great title. I'll yeah. say that. But I do agree it's jumping the gun a bit. It's like, dude, it's been like a decade and a half. you got to wait to see how that lands. Spider-Man, I feel like the only mistake they can make in any opening whatsoever is having Spider-Man go up against a Star Wars movie. Other than that, Spider-Man's in the clear. You put it wherever you want. For the July weekend, it, a, a movie that weekend usually always smashes. I feel like that's prime real estate for Spider-Man. I have all the faith in the world for Spider-Man. The only thing that makes me nervous 
this is that Sony was happy with the direction. That makes me back up and be like, I, I hope it's still okay, you know, because I'd rather <laughs> Marvel just go their way with Spider-Man and do their thing. But from what I saw in the trailer, I like the tone. If the trailer accurately displayed the tone they're going for, I like that uh, John Hughes feel among the Spider-Man superhero worlds, like Edge of 17 meets superheroes, and I think that's great. So uh, I'm happy with everything, but I do agree. It's like a hold off with Bad Boys 4, but I think Bad Boys for Life is a great time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? According to a report from THR, Zack Snyder has lined up a window to shoot his long in development passion project, The Last Photograph, with the reason being because Justice League 2 has been pushed back in order to make room for Ben Affleck's Batman movie. Justice League was originally scheduled to hit theaters on June 14, 2019, with an unknown DCEU movie dated for November 1, 2019. Though it remains unconfirmed, many outlets speculate that Ben Affleck's Batman will take the June 14th, 2019 release date, with Justice League 2 taking over the November 1st, 2019 release. Mark Barisal, the moving of Justice League to make way for Ben Affleck's Batman movie. I will buy that because I, I was actually disappointed hearing this story because I'm like, we gotta wait that long to see the standalone Batman? That's gonna be a bummer. I wanna see Batman get here sooner rather than later, even with all the anticipation for Justice League, which I have a lot of. I think it makes sense to do this, and if Zack Snyder needs to take a mental break or he really has this passion project, I think he should be able to pursue it, and it's a nice window to fit in there because we're not gonna be missing Zack Snyder's Justice League movies when we're seeing Ben Affleck's take on Batman, so I think that's cool, and this last photograph movie sounds pretty interesting. It's a war film. It's going to be very different than what he's doing with Justice League. So I think it's going to be a nice change of pace for him. I'm very excited to see Zack Snyder move away from the DC thing and see him, you know, flex his creative muscles on other projects and stuff like that. I'm, I'm going to sell this on, number one, I do want to see the Batman movie sooner, yes. But I'm going to sell this because it goes back to my constant criticism that I have of Warner Brothers and the way they handle DC. They have no plan. They have no plan. Mm. They come out, they announce this big slate, and then all of a sudden, it, it started to look like they had a plan. I was getting excited for what they were doing. And then all of a sudden, oh, then they become completely reactionary again. Oh, wait, people kind of like that Harley Quinn thing. We're going to do a Harley Quinn movie. And wait a minute, people are talking about Batman a lot more than we thought. They were. Oh, we're going to move Justice League and do this. It seemed like they have no plan. Everything they do is all knee-jerk reactionary, and it frustrates me because I think they have the creative talent, they have great properties. You got Batman, you got Superman, you got Justice League, you got Wonder Woman. You have all the things you need to make something awesome. All you gotta do is get the right people in the room, make a plan and stick to your plan and stop being so damn reactionary. And that's all I see. Whenever I look at the Warner Brothers stuff when it comes to DC, because I love Warner Brothers, and I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm one of the few people that I, I liked um, Batman v Superman, I like Suicide Squad, but this type of stuff drives me nuts, and so I'm going to sell it. Uh, yeah, every time you, I, you don't know this, John, but I'm going to inform you now. Every uh -oh. time you're like, they're reactionary, in my head I'm like, but I think we've seen the last of that. And then this happens, I'm like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> dang it. Um, but I agree. I feel like if they had a plan with Justice League and Justice League 2, because they were pretty close together at that point, and then Batman was going to come out after that, right? That I'm not wrong about this? Yes. Okay. No, they initially didn't even announce a date for, for Batman. Okay, all right. So I feel like Justice League and Justice League 2 had a kind of to-be-continued plan with a couple in there in the middle. And then now that they pushed it back and they have Batman in the middle, that makes me feel like I don't think you knew what Justice League 2 was going to be. I kind of don't think you knew what Batman was going to be, right, yeah. which freaks me out. Uh, so I'm selling that whole premise. I, I would rather them just like... Take a year, lock down your plan, be like, okay, that's it. And then when people are like, ah, but we just be like, don't worry, don't worry, confidence. <clears throat> it's all part of the plan, as one of your characters once said, a wise <laughs> character in a movie that I forget. And then, like, I, I feel like, like you just said, this is reactionary. And it's kind of like that dark moment where I have to realize, like, yeah, I don't think they have a plan. And now I get sad. Now I just, I'm sad. The Here, Batman. Here's the difference. Now, I, I don't like... I, I love Warner Brothers DC. I love Marvel and what they're doing. I don't like to, to compare them right. per se, but here is the fundamental difference, right? DC puts out Suicide Squad. It doesn't get the reaction that they wanted, even though idiots like me liked it. But they say, oh, some people reacted to Harley Quinn. Let's do a Harley Quinn movie, right? right? And here's the difference. Now let's go look over Marvel. Everybody in all the Captain America movies and stuff like that, everybody's seeing how much of a standout Scarlett Johansson is as Black Widow, right? Everybody's seeing that. Does Kevin Feige go, oh, oh, okay. people are really like, well, let's change our plan and do that. No, no. Kevin Feige goes, we've got a plan. Our plan is working. 
We are sticking to our plan. What we're doing is working. We're going to stick to it. Maybe we'll do something with that later down the line. But now, Marvel has also changed release dates, but there's always been strategic reasons for them. So this is just a great example of the difference between the two of them handle their their strategies, I guess. I don't know. Christian, how do you see it? I'm going to agree with you guys to where it is reactionary, but I'm going to actually buy it because I think that in order to come up with a plan like Marvel's, you've got to make changes and you've got to try things. You know, that's a good point. So, that's a really good point. And that, that's the thing. I don't disagree that it's like, hey, look, this is doing well. Let's try this. It's Batman. It's Ben Affleck directing Batman. So if they can place it, it might. this might be the start of the plan. So I'm okay with the fact that they're doing You mean doing the start of plan five? Well, well the newest plan. <laughs> yes. the, newest, the, the plan. The plan that we hope will work. Yeah. I think that yeah. that's what this... I actually like the idea of spacing them out because that's going to your Marvel reference. That's what they do. We don't get Avengers 1 and then Avengers 2 right afterwards. We get Avengers and we get Iron Man and then we get something else. And maybe that's what they need to do more. Maybe I want to learn... I'm going to learn more about Ben Affleck's Batman in this Justice League that's coming out. And through that, I'm going to want to see the standalone. Then I'm going to see that standalone. Then I'm going to want Justice League too even more so so i happen to think that yes it's reactionary but i think that it is it, it's going to fit into the plan i think they should stay away from the harley quinn movie because i think that they should focus on the main storyline here because they gotta they gotta focus on the narrative and that's what i'm hoping that's why i'm buying this because i think that this plan serves a narrative i don't think the harley quinn serves a narrative i think that what it does for as of right now is just like you said it's popular they liked her let's make a movie and if I'm wrong, if it actually serves what they're trying to do here, then I'm all for it. But I, I kind of like this this strategy. You actually raise a great point against my argument, which is like, okay, let's say DC, they have their plan, but they realize their plan isn't working and they come up with a better plan. Would I as a fan prefer them just to stick with the bad plan or would I prefer them to switch gears to the better plan they've come shot. out with? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think as a fan, I would want them to switch gears. It does then bring up another concern of mine, then why do you keep coming up with bad plans? Right. Why didn't you realize people wanted <laughs> Batman? Eight months ago. But isn't that the thing? Is that it's the shift, and it's, yeah. they can, they continuously tr they're trying whether they're announcing Jeff Johns or whatever they're doing. There's something that they're, they're trying to get it right. They're trying. They're trying. So yeah. maybe this is the this is the, the trying to get it right. Maybe they get it right. Yeah, I, I think the nerves you have is if they have this plan and then they push Batman back because Batman is the marquee name in the right. DC cinematic universe. So if something goes wrong there, then you can really start to get nervous. Until that happens, I have no problem with placing Batman in between the two Justice League movies because, like what Christian said, it's going to further that storyline. You're going to get little nuggets of Justice League inside that Batman when's movie. The, when's the embargo for Live by Night? Uh, middle of this week, I believe. All right, my, my next point's gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, listen, uh, we do this show live, so we'd like to save just a few minutes to take some of your live Twitter questions. Make sure you're tweeting out to us right now, at Collider Video. Wendy will pick a couple of questions out near the end of the show. I want to remind you that we've got a couple other things up here on Collider Video other than Movie Talk. Our Walking Dead mid-season finale, we put that up. That's up on our website right now. Make sure you check that out. And uh, keep your eyes open for everything else going on. A brand new Crash Course with Jeremy Johns Ooh. is up right now. Just keep your eyes open on our channel for the rest of the day for all the other cool stuff. For now, let's get to the mailbag. Make sure you email us your questions and thoughts to at, just not at, collidervideo at gmail.com. And we'll see if we can get to your question. Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Bobby writes, good morning, Collider crew. Now that Spider-Man is officially a part of the Marvel Universe and was part of Team Iron Man, do you think that Peter Parker had to sign the Sokovia Accords? If not, do you think the film will address it at all? Also, do you think the odds are above or below 80% that the new Spider-Man trailer beats the number of views that the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 trailer had in a 24-hour period? Thanks for all the entertainment. Um, I, I think that his involvement was pretty much kept secret by Tony Stark, so I don't think he signed the Sokovia Accords yet. Besides, he's not an Avenger. They made that clear in the new trailer. Uh, over, under 80%, I'd say under 80%. Um, I would say that he has not signed the Sokovia Accords. I think Tony Stark is a savvy enough business person to say, don't worry, we'll put that in good faith. You're going to sign that eventually. You don't have to sign it right now. Jeremy. I agree. He probably didn't. However, there was somebody with a camcorder that he was watching on a laptop. Someone recorded him taking Ant-Man down, Ant down like Empire Strikes Back, but I agree he didn't <laughs> sign him. Uh, and I think uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 will remain the big threat. Christian. No, he's the only one that's really wearing a mask so nobody knows who he is and they can't track him down anyway. So, uh, and good then, point. And then the other one is... Uh, no, uh, what would you say? Under, under, would you guess under what? How many? Eighty percent. Yeah, I would say same thing. Okay, what's next? 
Rocky Drago writes, Greetings, Rocky Collider Drago Crew. Green. One of the most anticipated films for many people next is War for the Planet of Apes. Hashtag Apes on Horses. My question is, do you think it will cross the billion dollar mark? Rise made almost $482 million and then Dawn made a little over $710 million. I personally feel it will come close but won't due to the massive competition it will face in July. Does it rely on the quality? And if so, if it's the best in the Ape series, will it have a chance? Thanks for taking my question and bring on the filthy. Yeah, and do- Look, I know there's lots of competition in the summer, but the, there's a reason they put all those movies in the summer because that's when everybody's going to the movies. So it can still absolutely dominate. It, it Look, it's just what you said. It all depends on how good the movie is. If the movie gets great reviews and it's in line with the other ones, then yes, I do believe this one will cross the billion dollar mark. But that's a huge asterisk of it's got to be really, really good. If it is, it will make it. Yeah, um, if, if it crushes, if it actually lands in this good movie, this is one of the best movie trilogies out there um, and I can see it in this day and age crossing the billion dollar mark if it's good I think it's got a shot it's going to be tough though for yeah. sure and, I, and this is coming from someone who loves the first two I mean I love them and I think that and I'm really looking forward to this one it's got a chance it's going to be tough though I do think the competition does does take a little bit uh, does or excuse me relies on it a little bit so I, I, I don't know I'm going to say I'm going to say no, but I'm going to say it with a heavy heart. I'm going to say it's a great film. I'm going to say it's award-worthy. I'm going to say it's not going to cross the billion-dollar mark because the week before it, it's got Spider-Man Homecoming coming out. The week after, it's got Dunkirk coming out. Yeah. That's another war movie. I just, I know competi- everybody's going to want to see Apes. I just don't think it quite gets to a billion dollars, but it's going to be very, very profitable. I think the math is interesting. Because the first movie was great, it had like a, oh gosh, what was it, like a a 60% increase into yeah. the next one, and the second one, and the second one was even yeah. better, yeah. across 710. If it holds that mathematical trajectory, it's not going to have too hard of a problem. And to get critically, that the billion. second one, people loved a lot more, yeah. too. So, yeah. And we could have apes on horses with bazookas. Apes yeah. and choppers. Apes and tanks. <laughs> and yeah. Choppers. Kids yeah. love monkeys with bazookas. Apes and tanning salons. All right, guys, I said we'd save a few minutes for your live questions, and we're going to do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out of the Twitter sphere? The first one comes from Bazinga Guy, who writes, is Deadpool... Golden Globe nomination, a start to maybe the Oscars nominating comic book films. Uh, the Oscars have nominated comic book films several times for many different Oscars, so I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and no, the, <laughs> the Golden Globes the Golden Globes is an atrocious joke, so no. The, nothing that happens at the Golden Globes means anything. I don't know what you guys think. I think they mean best picture. I think they, 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 they mean best picture. Um, no, but, uh, it will not, it no, will not I, get nominated I, I, for I best picture. I think the Oscars are a bit too stuffy in this day and age to nominate a comic book film for best picture. Christian. Christian, how you doing? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> um, I don't, yeah, I, I, oh, that was good. I don't know. I got to think about it. Well, I, I mean, I, I think the reason why the question gets asked because Deadpool did uh, was nominated for a Critics' Choice Awards, and a lot of times those top 10 translate into the top 10 for the Oscars, but I love Deadpool to death. I don't see it being a top 10 movie as far as the Oscars. Oscars are concerned. Okay, what's next? Ben Brasuya says, why do you think the feud at the end of filming Fast 8 between The Rock and Vin Diesel was, Vin Diesel was fake, and now that we know what the plot is about? Oh, it was fake. Oh, total fake. No doubt. It was, look, first of all, uh, if it wasn't for WrestleMania implications, uh, and that aside, the, there is no smarter, more savvy social media celebrity than The Rock. If anybody comes close, it's Vin Diesel. If they actually had beef, no way that makes it in social media. Not a chance in the world. Look, it's now that we've seen the trailer and we know The Rock is actually going to be fighting Vin Diesel in the movie. Look, there's there's absolutely no way any of that was real. No, especially after this plot. And you can already see, I wouldn't be surprised if The Rock came up with it all and said, like, yeah. hey, what if we do this? And then I'll, I'll shoot out this tweet, you do that. And then whether or not Vince got on board with it for WrestleMania or whatever it might be. Yeah, this is an absolute uh, work. It's like Harloff and a Schmodown tweet, guys. It's all <laughs> part of the plan. <laughs> the Rock was, he comes from professional wrestling. This is what they do. I know Christian does want to hear it. Professional wrestling, it's scripted. It's not real. <laughs> well, it's real-ish. It's not real okay. at all. What's next? Neither is Redskins football. So I think Got this, a win uh, yesterday. <laughs> What happened? I missed something. We won the NFC East That's last true. year. That's We're true. in line for the second wild card. We just need the Bucks to lose, and we'll control our own destiny against the New York Giants. I knew that would get them. <laughs> All right, what's next? I think this person is asking about Star Wars. Uh, Ten- Tenvi Real writes, why is embargo till Tuesday when the movie comes out on Thursday? Two days are more than enough to drop spoilers. It's not an unreasonable... I mean, the official date is Friday is when it, when it opens up. It's not an unreasonable... A lot of times it's within one week. I'll be honest with you. Reading those social media reactions, 
Um, I am. I do wonder. I, I'm questioning the wisdom of Disney making everybody hold off on on their reviews that long. I think it, they probably could have let the reviews come out uh, over the weekend or a little bit sooner than that. But uh, there's no red flags here. Believe me, there's no red flags. And yeah. Well, but why? Why? Like, there's so much positive buzz from Rogue One just from the social media we've seen. So if people are talking about it and they're that excited. Why risk it by having somebody write an actual review where they might have a couple negative things to say about the movie? It's all goodwill for Row One right now, so I think it was a perfect play. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of surprised, cause especially what, for what Disney did with Civil War, but they're like, embargo's like a month early, have fun. Uh, in terms of spoilers, um, I, I, when you get invited to one of these press things, there is a big red thing that's like, hey, please don't spoil it for people. It's I mean, <laughs> don't, don't be that guy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, so it, I, I, I can't see any spoilers coming out, but I, I am surprised that it's that late yeah they I, I am too i i don't i i agree with you guys i think that they should have let the, re the reviews come out because it's it i mean i said it in my thing it's a good movie so they should they should absolutely they should have let everybody go out review it make sure no one spoils it and i'm surprised they didn't do it earlier all right last question of the day last one comes from cut to black who writes any collider internships coming anytime soon and what do you look for in new hires uh, you know, I did a I did a Facebook video on what we look for when we, we hire people here, you know, whether it's behind the scenes in front of the camera, if it's in front of the camera, is it a pundit or is, is it a host, is it a presenter, is it is it editorial or is it writing, is it, you know, is, there's a whole bunch of different things. I, I would suggest, tr try to find my Facebook page, my, my video that I did on what do we look for at Collider when we're hiring people. I did a specific video on that and I don't want to waste any more of your time just talking about that here right now. Um, all right, guys, that'll do it for it, for, that, for us, for this installment of Movie Talk. Thanks so much much for joining us. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me, Mr. Christian Harloff. Where can people find you online? Well, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian Harloff every Thursday on Collider Jedi Council and I repped Collider Jedi Council on the Star Wars Movie Fights edition on Screen Junkies. Go check that out. Mr. Jeremy Johns. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Jeremy Johns, Facebook at Real Jeremy Johns, and sitting on my couch during Star Wars premieres. <laughs> Over here, Mark Ellis. Uh, you can find me at Men's Warehouse dropping off the tux today, uh, unless you want to borrow it to go I'm there. see your screening I'm today. There. Jeremy's going to be wearing my tux, then I'll drop it off at Men's Warehouse at Mark Ellis Live. Miss Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And of course, Wendy Lee. On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Uh, you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter just at John Campia. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. We appreciate your involvement. And listen, the most important thing about this show is not what we have to say. It's what you have to say. Jump into the comments section. Leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discuss here today. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.